So we just finished a section called trig integrals, and now we're doing a section called trig substitutions. So it might, oh, that word is misspelled apparently. Oh well. Oh. So the good news is the trig substitutions, although they both, they will have trig in it, trig substitutions start out not having trig inside of them. And you're going to insert, you're going to substitute uh, what will look like a polynomial for a trig, trigonometric expression. So we're going to actually intentionally complicate things in order to uh, exploit a relationship that will let us turn this into a reasonable integral. So what we're going to do first, before we actually do examples, is look at some trigonometry and why this stuff actually works out. So let's build a little table. So on the left side, this will be the sub, the substitution we're going to make. And on the right side, this will be what we are going to integrate. So the first one we'll look at is a tangent. So when we make this substitution, This table is going to be exactly three lines long. So we can go ahead and close it off. It's going to be exactly that big. So when x is a tangent theta, I'm going to divide by a, x over a equals tan theta. And drawing out the triangle that this measures, we have theta down there. X is opposite and A is adjacent. And I call the third side, I could call it H, but let's just skip right to square root A squared plus X squared. So that's just Pythagorean theorem finding the other side. And writing out So let's simplify a squared plus x squared. So x is a tan theta. So I'm going to replace x by a tan theta. We can factor out a. Well, we'll do this in a few steps. We have a squared tan squared theta. So we get a squared times 1 plus tan squared theta. And what is 1 plus tangent squared theta? We just saw this, I think, yesterday. Uh, Secret squared. squared. Hopefully it's on your cheat sheet somewhere, if you don't know it already. So this will allow us to simplify a squared plus x squared into a squared secant squared. So if we started with so if we began with the square root a squared plus x squared, we could change this around to the square root a squared sec squared theta, which is a secant theta. Because the square root cancels the squared right there. And the other, if you want to see the other step, this is just a sec theta squared. That's how we cancel the square root and the square. So they're both inside terms are squared. So this is going to be really useful if we start out with square root a squared plus x squared. This will be a good sub. You can write more details, but if you know enough trig, you'll be able to integrate this right here. So our next substitution we're going to make, x equals a sine theta. And we'll do 
do that down below. So I'm going to do all the same stuff. So divide by a, x over a equals sine theta, draw the triangle. There's theta and opposite is x, hypotenuse is a. So what is our third side, our non-hypotenuse side? x squared minus a? Almost. So so it's going to be a big side, a squared, minus a little side, x squared, and then square root that. You can write out your whole Pythagorean theorem and give this side a name like b and solve for b if you want to, but this is what you'll get. And this is useful. Because if we have a squared minus x squared, We'll convert this, so if x is a sine theta, we have minus a sine theta squared. a squared minus a squared sine squared theta. So factor out the a, and what can I write in place of one minus sine squared? That's uh, co-squared right there. So this is a squared co-squared. And let's go ahead and take that square power outside. We'll just write this as a cos theta whole thing squared. So we can replace a squared minus x squared with a cos theta squared. So if we begin with a squared minus x squared square root, we can simplify this to a cos theta. So that square root will cancel the square. So we'll write that up top. Square root a squared minus x squared is when we use this. So our last, you might think cosine would be the last one we choose. We're going to use secant instead. You can use cosine, you can use cosecant, you can use cotangent, but you won't get any additional forms. You'll just get a different way to do one of these three forms. So it won't be, uh, you won't get any extra utility out of looking at the other three functions. So we got secant, this goes a secant theta. And same thing, x over a equals sec theta, and secant is 1 over cos. So draw the triangle. There's theta. So secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. So hypotenuse x adjacent a. And our last side is hypotenuse squared minus adjacent squared square root. So there's our third side. So let's look at x squared minus a squared and sub out x for a sec theta squared minus a squared. Factor out a squared. Now, secant squared minus 1 is tangent squared. So this turns into a tan theta squared. So this would be useful if you begin with square root x squared minus a squared, and this will end up being a tan theta. So if we start with square root x squared minus a squared, we can turn that into a tangent theta with this substitution. So 
So what's inside the table is what I recommend you at least include this much on your cheat sheet. You can include more depending on your level of comfort with trig. The other good thing to include if you want to is this last identity. So our first one, a squared plus x squared equals a seek theta. And this next one, a cos theta. And our last one was a tan theta. Now we're going to um, apply these to some examples, but let me give a word of warning. When you integrate, we're actually changing variables. So it's basically a u substitution. And whenever you change variables, you need to also change your dx, or whatever your d, y, whatever other letter, dt, sometimes shows up. You're going to have to change that into your new variable. So this is a little different than a u sub. So we'll write that uh, over here. And you change x equals f of theta. It's a little bit different substitution because before we were letting u equal a function of x. And here we're letting x equal a function of uh, theta in this case. So what does dx equal? You only need about three brain cells. F prime theta. Yeah, basically f prime, theta, and then d theta is what we also need. Uh, you could do the intermediate step, dx d theta equals f prime theta, and then solve for dx by moving d theta to the other side. dx equals f prime theta d theta. So when we make our substitution, we also have to take out dx and put something slightly more complicated in its place. And it'll be the derivative of the function we subbed in. So that's the price we have to pay for changing variables, just like when we did a u sub. And of course, unsub at the end. That should be obvious when you get to your answer and you got all these thetas hanging around and you start out with x's and your answers should be in x's, not in thetas. So our first example, integral dx over square root 4 plus x squared. Now before we go forward and make our trig sub, you can solve this another way. What way would you have solved this before? I think this is the arc sign, or one, certainly one of the arc, one of the uh, Inverse, it's probably arc sine. There's, I think, four or five others or seven others that it could be. So you just look at that list and it's one of those on the list. You could solve it that way. What we're going to do is solve it the trig sub way. So there are multiple ways to solve integrals. We're going to choose the trig sub way here. In this particular case, you would probably get there faster if you use the uh, arc sine. You're going to end up with the same answer. It's just the way you got there will be different. So we have the first one, a squared plus x squared square root. And a is uh, 2 for us. Looks like it's 4, but it's really 2, because you're looking at a squared, not a. Um, and I should write somewhere, a should always be greater than 0. So don't. And if a equals 0, you have something way more simple than what you're doing. So if a equals 0, you just got square root x squared. And that's you don't do it this way. So we're going to let x equal a tan theta. And of course, our a is 2. So x equals 2 tan theta. This is really all you need off your cheat sheet if you can do calculus and remember your trig. So this is x, so I need to figure out what is dx. So dx is derivative 2, derivative tangent is secant squared theta d theta. And we're going to go ahead and sub these in. So 
I'm going to write 4 as 2 squared plus 2 tan theta squared. So we got a 2 squared and another 2 squared. And we can bring that outside. And we're left with 1 plus tan squared. Am I skipping too many algebra steps? I'm skipping a few, but there's a lot of other stuff to do, so I'm not going over every, uh, every algebra step so we can get through this a little more quickly. So we got the 2 and the square root of 2 squared are going to cancel completely. And 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared. So we've got secant squared over square root secant squared, and square root secant squared cancels out to secant, which will cancel one of the secants in the numerator. So we got one secant in the denominator cancels out one of the secants in the uh, numerator. Now for this one, we already did this antiderivative. We did it back in the, I think, in a, no. I think it was before integration by parts. I can't remember when it was. I think it was back in U sub. Way, way back. Yeah, or no, it was back when we did natural logs back then. So it's secant plus tangent. And you should have all six trig functions, derivatives, and antiderivatives, either memorized or on your cheat sheet. A lot of them you probably have them memorized, and whatever ones you don't have memorized need to go on your cheat sheet. So this is not okay for a final answer. For what reason? Thetas, not x's. Yeah, I'm done, done doing calculus, but I have my answer in thetas, so I have to come back to x. So let's see how to do that. I see that tangent theta, if I divide by 2, I'll get tangent theta as x over 2. So that one's easy. What about secant theta? That's going to be a little bit more difficult. So you could draw your triangle out and simplify it that way. So tangent theta is x over 2. Drawing a triangle, theta x is opposite, adjacent is 2. The other side is x squared plus 2 squared. So what is secant theta in this triangle? Secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. Square root x squared plus 2 squared over 2. And we're back into x's, and this is our answer right here. So if you went the other way, you would get a hyperbolic inverse trig function of some stuff. And it would be the equivalent of this if you went that way. Next up, we're going to do another integral. And this one won't be able to be solved in another way.
So why is this not right for a for one of those uh, inverse trig antiderivative forms? Because of the x squared. Because of which x squared? The top x squared. The top x squared. None of them have an x squared on the top. I think there's one or two that allow an x on the denominator, but none of them allow an x in the numerator. So none of those are going to help you integrate this one right here because of that x squared in the numerator. So what we're going to do is trig sub. So trig sub is a more general uh, way to solve these. It's more general than those special inverse trig forms that you saw. So I see 9 minus x squared. So I can see already a equals, equals 3. And scrolling up, a squared minus x squared square root. We're in the second line of our table. So this is our a, uh, x equals a sine theta substitution. Any questions on why I chose that second one? It was entirely because of what's inside the square root. That's why I chose it. And of course, we're going to swap out x. We have to change dx, derivative the sine, cosine, d theta. So I'm going to do something bad, and I want you to tell me why this is a bad move. So what is incorrect? Still have an x squared. Yeah, so I sort of went to thetas, but it didn't go all the way. So you got to change everything. So that x squared needs to be, looking down here, 3 sine theta squared. So we got 3 squared times another 3 is 3 cubed. And in the denominator, we're going to factor out a 3 squared, and it's going to be square rooted. So we got sine squared in the numerator, cos divided by square root 1 minus sine squared d theta. Why is that 3 cubed on top? Yep. Why? Uh, so we got 3 squared from that first term, and then one more 3. So it will turn into a 3 squared because it's going to cancel with that 3 in the denominator. And 1 minus sine squared is cos squared. So this is square root cos squared. And square root cos squared cancels with the cosine right there. So we just have 9 integral sine squared theta d theta. How do we integrate even power of sine? So we have no odd powers. Those are the easy ones. When you have some odd powers, the sines are cosines. So we got no odd powers, so we're going to have to reduce the power. So that identity we use is sine squared theta is 1 half 1 minus cos 2 theta. So when all your sine cosine powers are even, you have to go this way. So it's 9 halves antiderivative, 1 minus cos 2 theta d theta. And remember, this is not a change of variables. So all we're doing is rewriting with a trig identity. So there's nothing to change your d theta to. So 
So antiderivative one is theta. I'm gonna take a guess at cos two theta and guess that it's negative sine two theta and then I'm going to check. So what's the derivative of sine of negative sine two theta is negative cos two theta times two. So I have to un times two or divide by two. We're done integrating, so we have a plus constant, but of course we didn't start with thetas, so we have to unsub out of thetas. So somewhere up here, we said x equals three sine theta. So x over three equals sine theta. You can get some really fancy trig in here and figure out what's sine two theta using some double angle fanciness, but let's just not spend too much time simplifying trig. I'm just going to take sine inverse on both sides. And wherever I see theta, I'm gonna write sine inverse x over three. The second one is a little bit more difficult to write. It is sine of two times sine inverse x over three, all that over two. Unfortunately, you can't just cancel the sine sine inverse because it's sine of two times sine inverse. So you'd have to use some uh, careful trig simplification and it may not actually get more simple. So we're going to leave it like this. So these trig uh, substitutions just take practice. And you still have a pretty hefty integral to do after you make your substitution, just because you got out of that square root problem. You still don't have an easy integral most of the time. And the next section is partial fractions. So hopefully you like algebra and fractions, because there's a lot of algebra and fractions coming up, including a little in linear algebra. We might use a matrix or two to figure out a system, a linear system. So we'll start with a review of how polynomials and division work, and then write out how we break up partial fractions, and then go ahead and do some examples. So this is one way to think about division. A polynomial divided by another is equal to the actual quotient plus the remainder of your original denominator. And this r of x is the remainder from division. So for each irreducible factor in the denominator, well, so Q of X will be a polynomial. So the first thing you have to do is factor it out. So you have to factor it down to irreducible factors, or also known as factoring all the way. So it's a polynomial that must be factored. And we're going to factor our polynomial over the real numbers. 
So what does that mean? If there's complex factors or complex roots, we're not going to factor those out. So what does that mean? Something like x squared plus 1 could factor. Of course, this is a difference of squares, but they're complex squares. So it yes. factors x minus i times x plus i because i squared, oh, where am I? Plus i. Uh, so this is x squared minus i squared, and of course, minus i squared is positive 1. But we're not going to factor out the complex numbers. So what we're going to do, if we get x plus 1, we're going to leave it like that. We're not going to factor down to the complex numbers, is all I'm saying. So there'll be some quadratics that we don't factor out because they don't have uh, real factors. So this is what we call irreducible over the real numbers. So you factor Q, and you get a bunch of products or a bunch of factors. We'll call the first one Q1 of X. Now you could have a factor appear four times or two times, more than once. So these might be raised to some powers, so that'll be raised to the A1 power. So the power is how many times that factor appeared. Q2x raised to the a2 power. And we don't know exactly how many factors it'll go to. We'll just say there's n factors raised to a to the n power. So when ak is greater than 1, you have repeated factor. The examples I give you, I don't plan to repeat a factor more than twice. So you're generally, the most you're going to see a repeated factor is twice on the examples I will give you. And for each repeated factor, well, we'll deal with it when we get there. We'll come back and fill in this rule. start out with an easier one. So let's start with this. Break up 1 over x times x minus 1. So the way we do it, it was we write, for each denominator, we write a separate fraction. Or I should say for each factor, so two factors, you're going to have two fractions here. deal with repeats after this, but for each different factor you get a denominator. I don't know the numerator, and that's what we need to figure out. So I don't know the numerator, so I'm going to just use two letters. I'm going to figure out what are A, what is A, and what is B. A and B are going to be numbers. So the numerators so these numerators are just numbers, but in general, your numerators are going to be one degree lower polynomial than your denominator. All 
are one degree lower generic polynomials. And I say generic polynomials because I don't know anything about them other than their polynomials, in this case of degree zero. So they're just going to be constant numbers. So it, I'm going to write some degree 0, 1, and degree 2 generic polynomials. So degree 0, here's a generic polynomial, just some number. What's a degree 1 generic polynomial? ax plus b. And degree 2, ax squared plus bx plus c. You won't need to go, pat, I think, past degree 1, really. But you don't know the coefficients a, b, and c. It's our job to figure out what are these coefficients. So before we go any further, is it believable that when you add these two fractions, your denominator will be the correct denominator? Think about how you add fractions. How do you add fractions? Common denominator. So what will our common denominator be? The product of these two, x times x minus 1. So at least our denominator looks good. We got to pick the right numbers, A and B, so the numerator works out. Yes, sir. Uh oh. Should be minus one. So there are at least two ways to figure out these A and B values. One way to do it, well, no matter what, I think we all agree fractions suck. So what algebra can I do to get out of fraction land? So we're going to do is multiply by the denominator. So the, the big denominator on the left side, or all denominators on the right side, however you want to think about it. Multiply by the thing that will give you no fractions. So left side we got 1, on the right side we have a, x minus 1 plus bx. So now that we're here, the two main ways to figure out the coefficients, plug in some x values is one way, and uh, combined coefficients is another way. So the easier way is plug in x values, or the faster way is plug in x values. Plug in x values, or what was the second method? Uh, match, matching coefficients. Oh, this works for every x value. There's two x values that are really smart to plug in here that will work out really nicely. I could pick any x values, any two, and get to the answer. But there are two that make it very easy. So when you plug in these x values, they're your choice. There's some good choices and some less uh, useful choices. And the second way is match coefficients. And the second choice, match coefficients, always works. The only drawback is it takes more time. So that's the penalty you pay. It always will work out, but it can take a little more time and a little more effort. So what are some good x values to plug in? One is really good. Why is one good? Because a is going to disappear. And then the x is going to disappear. And we're going to figure out what b is really quickly. So plug in x equals 1. So we get 1 equals 0 plus b. Oh, b is 1. 
That was pretty easy. What is another good x value? Let's go with 2. Plug in 2. Now we know b is 1, so I'm going to fill in 1 where I see b. Let me do that before we plug in 2. So b is 1. So we have 1 equals a x minus 1 plus 1x. And we can subtract the 1x. And let's plug in x equals 1 again, see what we get. So we learned that 0 equals 0. Very insightful. So if you reuse an x value, you won't get any more information out. So that's what will happen if you reuse one. So let's pick another one. How about x equals 2? So 1 minus 2 equals a, 2 minus 1. Oh, this one works out really well. a is negative 1. What's another x value I could have used that would have been easy as well? Zero. Yeah, 0 is good. It would have completely eliminated b right off the bat. And if we plugged in 0, it should be pretty clear a is negative 1 also. So we wouldn't be able to figure out a is negative 1 right from this equation without even know knowing what b was. So either way, a is negative 1. And we're going to write that back in the original. Let's see. So we got a, we got b. We're going to fill those values in up, up top. So fill values in. We have negative 1 over x, and b is positive 1 plus 1 over x minus 1. How can you check if this is right? Maybe I just made up all this stuff. Well, how do we check if these are equal? Could plug in values. But we can't check every single x value. Can we, take the we could take both sides derivatives and see if they're equal. So that would tell us they were equal, except they might be off by a constant. Take a limit. What if we just do algebra on the right side? What can I do on the right side? Add them together. Common denominator. So let's check. Check right now. Add the two on the right together. Make sure that we're correct. I know that's an algebra one move. So we're right. It adds up to 1 over x times x minus 1. Um, negative. So this negative made it negative x plus 1 right there. And then the negative x positive x cancel. Now when I make up your partial fractions problem, all I do is I just pick some fractions and add them together. And I don't even add them together. I let Wolfram add them together so I don't make a mistake. <laughs> so this is the easiest problem for me to make to put on your quiz. It takes me all of 30 seconds to add up two or three fractions and make the problem. And then it takes you 10 to 20 minutes to break it back down and figure out what three fractions that I add together to give you that fraction right there. 
So in this case, checking your work is way faster than breaking up your fraction in the first place. So this is pretty much the reverse process of everything you learned about fractions. We're going the opposite direction. So we're taking a fraction and unadding it. And we'll do another example here. So this is going to be, we're going to decompose this fraction. x squared plus 1 is irreducible, so I don't break that down anymore. x minus 1 appears twice. So we have to deal with the fact that that's there twice. So here are what our new fractions look like. Our first denominator, x squared plus 1, so that's our first factor, is written there, plus our next factor, x minus 1, no problem. There's a third one because x minus 1 appears twice. You get 1, it appears once as a first power and once as a squared. So we got a first right here, first power, and then we'll have a second. Right there. If it was cubed, I'd have first, second, and a third as well. So when it comes to numerators, I have a degree 2 polynomial, which means I need a degree 1 in the numerator. So our first numerator is ax plus b. The next one is degree 1, so I need degree 0 in the numerator. So we're just using c. Now the next one, it looks like it should be dx plus e, but you go to the irreducible degree, which is only 1 in this case. However, good news, if you're at dx plus e, you're going to find out that d is 0. So if you write a higher degree polynomial than you need, you'll figure out your high power coefficients are all going to go to 0 if they were actually unneeded. So if you write a higher degree than you need, you'll be OK. So we really only need d right there, not dx plus e. And we'll break this down tomorrow. I say this is a little more difficult. There is no real x value that makes that 0. So you won't be able to just pick an x value and get rid of it.